building, building room 216. They're in a break right now and should be resuming shortly. The Senate's voting an amendment on the 2006 spending bill for the Departments of Commerce and Justice. John Roberts is back in the room. Senator Grassley, you see there at the uh, at the dais, he will be the first to lead off questions. 20 minutes of questions coming up. He'll be followed by Senator Biden of Delaware and John Kyle of uh, Arizona. We have a round of 20-minute questions, and there could be additional rounds after that. According to the committee's schedule, they'll take a break for lunch at about 1 Eastern. And then once they wrap up this round of questions, the, the committee will go into a closed session to review the FBI report on the nominee. The hearings were just uh, a few minutes tardy because we just finished the vote. Uh, and we now turn to uh, Senator Grassley for his 20 minute second round. Thank you. Once again, uh, compliment you on how you've handled yourself at these hearings. You've done very well. It's going to be very hard for people to cast an old vote against you. Judge Roberts. Uh, do you believe that every citizen who meets the qualifications set forth in the Constitution and our laws should have the opportunity to cast a free and unfettered vote? And as a follow-up, will you, uh, on the court, fairly apply the Voting Rights Act? Well, I certainly agree that uh, every citizen who meets the qualifications not only has the right to vote but should vote. I think it's a, a problem that we don't have more people uh, voting and any issues that come before me under the Voting Rights Act, uh, I will confront those uh, uh, with an open mind and decide them after full and fair consideration of the arguments in light of the precedence of the court uh, and in light of a recognition of the uh, critical role that the right to vote is, uh, plays as preservative of all other rights. Thank you. Uh, the Supreme Court has repeatedly stated that the legislative history of a particular bill is critical to interpretation of the statute. 
Of course, Justice Scalia is of the opinion that most expressions of legislative history, like committee reports or uh, statements uh, by the senators on the floor or, or the House, are not entitled to great weight because they are unreliable indicators of legislative intent. Presumably, Judge Scalia believes that if the members don't actually write a report or don't actually vote on a report, then there's no need to defer to this expression of congressional intent. Uh, now, obviously, I have great regard for Justice Scalia, his intellect, legal reasoning. But, of course, as I told you in our office, I don't really agree with his position. So asking you, I'd like to ask you five questions that are relatively short, so I'll ask them all at once. What is your opinion? How important is legislative history to you? Uh, how have you utilized it? And will it be any different from your use on the circuit court versus what you might do on the Supreme Court? And did you refer to any committee reports or congressional debate in any of your 39 briefs before the Supreme Court? And uh, to what extent do you, and don't start out with this last one, to what extent do you share Justice Scalia's view on unreliability of legislative history, although that's important? I'd, I, I'd like, and I can repeat those if you forget what I've asked. Sure. Well, if I if I leave one out, uh, uh, you can remind me at the end. But um, uh, obviously, when you're dealing with interpreting a statute, the most important part is the the text. You begin with the text, and as the Supreme Court has said, in many cases, perhaps most cases, that's also where you end. The answer is clear. Uh, I have, though, uh, uh, as a judge, uh, relied on legislative history to help clarify ambiguity in the text. Uh, I, uh, the Supreme Court stated once, and I think it's a very important principle, you look to legislative history to clarify ambiguity. You don't look to legislative history to create ambiguity. In other words, if the text is clear, that is what you follow, and that's binding. And you don't look beyond it to say, well, if you look here, though, maybe this clear word should be interpreted a different way. On the other hand, we confront situations where the text is not clear, and the legislative history can be helpful in resolving that ambiguity. Uh, it requires a certain sensitivity to what you're dealing with. Uh, all legislative history is not created equal. There's a difference between the weight that you give a conference report and the weight you give a statement of one legislator on the floor. Uh, you have to, I think, have some degree of sensitivity in understanding exactly what you're looking at, appreciate where those comments were made in the legislative process, be careful to make sure that they're dealing with the same language that was eventually adopted. You have to, for example, be very uh, skeptical about uh, statements by opponents of the bill. It's quite a common thing saying, well, this bill would do this, this, and this, and so we shouldn't pass it. That's not always the best guide as to what the sponsors really intended in the language. Um, so it does require a certain sensitivity to what you're dealing with. But uh, I have uh, quoted and looked to legislative history in the past to help determine the meaning of ambiguous terms, and um, I, I would expect to follow that same approach on the Supreme Court. I don't think there's a difference there uh, in terms of uh, what things you think it is appropriate to look to to help uh, you do your job, which is to uh, uh, figure out what Congress intended. Uh, and you didn't address Judge Sc Scalia, but let me uh, put it another way so I don't put you in a bad position. Uh, you would uh, see, uh, at least in some instances where it needs to be used, reliability in legislative history. Reliability. In some instances, I think uh, uh, if you look at it carefully, you can make an assessment that this is a reliable guide. And one one uh, area I didn't touch on the in my arguments, I've certainly relied on legislative history in presenting arguments because, of course, in the Supreme Court you need five votes and not just the one. So you tend to cast your net as widely as, uh, as possible. And uh, at argument, sometimes uh, uh, Justice Scalia would not be as receptive to an argument based on legislative history as some of the others. But uh, again, uh, the, the name of the game is, is counting to five when you're arguing up there. And so uh, I've certainly made arguments based on legislative history. Okay. Uh, in regard to how you view and use legislative history, I'd like to discuss your opinion in Totten, Barm Bombardier Corporation case interpreting the False Claims Act. The issue on appeal was whether Bombardier 
had met the presentment requirements of the False Claims Act to violate the statute according to Section 3729A1, a company must have presented its false claim to an officer or employee of the federal government. Importantly, Section 3729C explicitly provides that the term claim includes demands for payment submitted to government contractors whether or not they are resubmitted to the federal government. In your opinion, you wrote that those facts of that case did not consist of a false claims under the False Claims Act because there can only be a false claims if it's literally presented to somebody that's a federal government employee, I assume. It seems to me that to reach this result, you inserted a resubmission requirement into the law in place where it doesn't in fact appear, Section 3729A1, and in fact gave short shrift to the legislative history which spelled out what Congress intended when it amended the Act in 86. The legislative history of the Act in the Senate Committee Report, now I didn't refer to my authorship of, of the legislation, but uh, anyway in our city, uh, Senate Committee Report explaining that liability under the False Claims Act attaches to a submission of, and I quote, a false claim to the recipient of a grant from the United States or to a state under a program financed in part by the United States, end of quote. The legislative history also states that Congress sought to ensure that, quote, a false claims was actionable, although the claim or false statements were made to a party other than the government if the payment thereon would ultimately result in a loss to the United States, end of quote. So my question is whether, on reflection, that is a fair way to deal with the express wishes of Congress and whether it is possible that you misunderstood the statute when you decided Totten case, uh, and why did you reject legislative history if you referred to it, and maybe you didn't refer to it, but why did you reject legislative history regarding the resubmission requirement in the False Claims Act when you wrote the opinion in Totten? Well, uh, Senator, the answer to your question is it's certainly possible that um, uh, the majority in that case uh, uh, didn't get it right, and the dissent that was a very uh, strong dissent did get it right. I, I think the majority got it right. Um, uh, there we focused on particular language. The issue in the case involved, as you know, uh, a, a subcontractor claim. You have the United States giving money to, in this case it was Amtrak, and then Amtrak using that money to hire a subcontractor, I think it was Bombardier, uh, to do a particular part of the, of the job. Um, everybody agreed that under the precedents that are applied, Amtrak is not the government. It can't be considered part of the government. And the, the, the statute, as you noted, required, it was triggered by the presentment of a false claim to an officer or employee of the United States. And the majority's reasoning uh, was that when the false claim was one made by Bombardier uh, to Amtrak, and that claim was submitted to Amtrak, and since Amtrak was not the government, well, what Judge Rogers and I concluded was that that wasn't presentment of a false claim to an officer or employee of the United States. Um, there was a, an extensive discussion in between the majority and the dissent. Your, the, the view that you've articulated was certainly presented in a compelling way by Judge Garland, my colleague on the Court of Appeals, and we spent a great deal of time on the case, and I think it's reflected in the opinions. And uh, uh, that view was laid out. Judge Rogers and I thought that the statutory language that said the claim had to be presented to an officer employee presented too high a hurdle for us to get over in looking at the legislative history. But I, I'm, I'm happy to concede that it was among the more difficult cases I've had over the past two years. Anytime um, uh, Judge Garland disagrees, you know you're in a, uh, uh, in a, a difficult area and the function of his dissent to make us focus on what we were deciding and to make sure that we felt we were doing the right thing I think was well served but uh, Judge Garland disagreed and so it's obviously to me a case on which reasonable judges can uh, disagree and I just have to rest on the analysis in the majority opinion.
Um, let me tell you something you might not be aware of, and that is that the Bush administration has filed an amicus brief in the Eleventh Circuit arguing that you had misread the False Claims Act in the Totten case. And in Atkins versus McIntyre, the administration has argued that there is no presentment requirement in Section 3730A2 of the False Claims Act, and that, quote, the Totten majority misconstrued the language and purpose of the False Claims Act in concluding that the Act does not encompass false claims record statements submitted to recipients of federal funds absent resubmission to a United States officer or employee. And I assume if I ask you if you have an opinion on that, you, you well, can't, probably can't answer it. Well, not on that one. I do know the, the Bush administration filed an amicus brief in our, our case as well. Um, I guess this would be one of those cases I would cite in response to the question of whether I'm capable of ruling against uh, the administration. We did in that case. Um, the, again, uh, the arguments, I think, were well presented on both sides, and um, uh, Judge Rogers and I gave it our best shot, and the opinion will stand or fall on its own. Well. Uh I hope sitting in the Marble Palace you'll remember that I have great pride in the success of the False Claims Act. Uh, $8 billion coming back to the Federal Treasury. Judge Roberts, uh, you filed an amicus brief in the case of United States versus Helper, a case which raised the question of whether a civil False Claims Act case could implicate double jeopardy clause. The Supreme Court agreed with your arguments and held that double jeopardy clause protects a convicted criminal defendant from a second punishment in the form of a civil sanction that, quote, may not fairly be characterized as remedial, end of quote, because it is, quote, overwhelmingly disproportionate to the damage the defendant has caused, end of quote. As you know, the helper decision was later overturned by Hudson. Uh, Judge Roberts, do you consider the False Claims Act treble damages provisions to be excessive, in the words of the court, overwhelmingly disproportionate, and also in the words of the court, not fairly characterized as remedial. Well, uh, you've touched on a case that's uh, very close to my heart, uh, Senator. It was the first case I argued uh, before the Supreme Court. Um, I was appointed by the court to argue it on behalf of uh, uh, Mr. Helper. Uh, it was it was an unusual case. It, it arose the the conspiracy at issue was a slight uh, inflation of uh, I believe it was Medicare or Medicaid claims that this individual was submitting. Uh, I think he added a dollar or a, or two dollars to every claim, um, and yet under the law at that time there was a minimum penalty for each false claim. So. I, I, these numbers won't be right, but he had something like 300 false claims for a grand total of maybe $700, but under the statute he was assessed a civil penalty of several million dollars because each of the false claims was uh, a, a, a separate uh, penalty. And the issue was, after having been sentenced criminally, would a civil penalty of several, and again, I'm not sure the numbers, but several million dollars for $700 or so of uh, fraud uh, was that remedial and civil or was it, it punishment? And uh, the court agreed with uh, my submission at the time that that was punishment. Um, it led to some difficulty, I think, in administering civil and criminal laws down the line. And as you said, uh, eight years later they uh, reversed course and overruled um, the helper precedent. But the, the provision that you specifically mentioned, treble damages, that's a little different. There it's, it's a much closer connection, obviously just three times whatever the damages are. In the helper case, it was a much more disproportionate uh, impact, and that's what led the court, I think, to conclude that that looks like punishment. Treble damages is something that's familiar in the law in a number of areas and is not regarded as impermissible punishment in this context. To, uh uh, are you familiar with the legal arguments that some opponents of the False Claims Act have made to the effect that its key TAM provisions are unconstitutional under Articles 2 and 3? And if so, do you have an opinion on these arguments? And before you answer, I'd like to remind you that uh, at least since the first Congress was involved in this, I'd like to assume that the framers of the Constitution, because the first Congress enacted several key TAM statutes, that if that be any deference to you in giving uh, 
uh, whether this fact would make any difference to you when assessing the constitutionality of KETAM statutes today? I think, um, if my memory serves, that the Article Three objections, and just so we're on the same page, the Ketom statutes, of course, are when uh, a, a private individual brings suit on behalf of the government for fraud on the government, and in return gets a percentage of the recovery. And as you noted, it's been, under the False Claims Act, very successful in, in securing recovery of uh, funds on behalf of the government. Um, the, Vermont, uh, the Vermont case, and I'm not remembering it any more than that, it was a case from Vermont, I think addressed most of the Article Three issues. The objection was that individual has no standing, I think, because he doesn't necessarily have an interest. And what the court said was that the individual has standing as a result of the the bounty, uh, as, if you will, the, the percentage he gets, that satisfies the standing requirement, so those objections are out of the way. I do know that some have raised additional objections under uh, Article 2, uh, which go to the fact that this uh, might interfere with the executive's authority to execute the law. In other words, you have private individuals bringing suit. Uh, I'm not sure that those issues have been finally resolved. Um, and uh, obviously, if those cases do come up, I'll want to keep an open mind. The, the factor you mentioned, obviously, about historic practice, that is something that the court does look to uh, in assessing constitutionality. If it's something that the founders uh, were familiar with or a practice that they engaged in and showed no disagreement with, that while not determinative, uh, that is a factor that the court uh, would look at. Uh, I don't know if any of those cases are going to come before the court, but uh, if they do, uh, it's, that's one of the considerations that will have to be taken into account. Uh, other than uh, Totten case and the Helper case, have you ever written or spoken publicly about the issue of the constitutionality of key TAMs or other, any other provisions of the False Claims Act? Uh, uh, to I your memory. I don't remember any, no, Senator. Okay. Uh, Judge Roberts, in 1986, while serving as an associate White House counsel, you approved uh, Reagan administration testimony regarding Whistleblower Protection Act of 86. You probably recall that the Reagan administration opposed that legislation, which is now law. Could you explain what role, if any, you had in formulating the administration's position on the Whistleblower Protection Act? Um, I don't recall any role, uh, Senator. Our office, uh, the Council's office, would routinely review uh, testimony that was about to be given. We were just looking out for particular constitutional concerns or issues. Our, we generally did not get into the substance. The substance of that would have been shaped over in the Justice Department, and our, we, we would have really been looking out for anything that we thought infringed on the uh, constitutional authorities of the President or presented other consistency issues. But the substance of the testimony is not something I was involved in. Do you feel that you have any bias against False Claims Act or the Whistleblower Protection Act that would impact on your ability to fairly decide cases on, the, uh, on those statutes? Uh, no, Senator. Um, I have had some whistleblower cases uh, in different aspects. Uh, uh, I do recall coming up in the Court of Appeals, and I, I think in some cases we ruled in favor, in some cases we ruled against. So I have seen those cases and have had no difficulty uh, fairly and objectively uh, deciding them. Are you against uh, cameras in the courtroom like Justice Rehnquist was? Well, you know, my, um, my new best friend, uh, Senator Thompson, assures me that te television cameras are nothing to be afraid of. Uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, I don't have a, a set view on that. Um, uh, I do think it's something that I would have to, I would want to listen to the views of, uh, if I were confirmed, to my colleagues. I would suggest then to the chairman that we move quickly on that bill before he's got an opinion on it. <laughs> I, no, I intend to do just that, Senator Grassley, now that I have your support. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Grassley. Senator Biden. Good morning, Judge. How are you? Good morning, Senator. Fine, thanks. I went back and looked at uh, something you said yesterday, which was reminded, I was reminded by my son, who's done some appellate work, nothing like you. And uh, he, he, he said, I thought I heard, heard him say this, and then I went to staff, got it. Yesterday morning you said, I went back once and counted the questions during my half hour there were over 100 questions the court asked. So you're not all offended by us interrupting you like we do. You're used to being interrupted, aren't you? I'm used to being interrupted before the court, that's yeah. for sure, Senator. Well, yes. we're, 
Well, we're kind of the court here. We're kind of the court. You're not entitled to the job. God love you. You've been nominated, and your job is to demonstrate that uh, um, there's no presumption, as you well know. So, uh, so I hope you won't mind some questions. I promise I won't interrupt if you give short answers. Okay? I'll try, Senator. All right. Great. Um, uh, I'd like to follow up on yesterday. I asked you if you agreed there was a right of privacy to be found in the uh, Liberty Clause of the 14th Amendment, and you said, and I quote, I do, Senator. I think, the court's ex I think that the court's expression, and I think if my reading of the precedent is correct, I think every justice on the court believes that to some extent or another, believes that to some extent or another. Is that correct? Yes. Now, you, one of the things that's been amazing, and you are one of the best witnesses that I think has come before this committee, and I've been here 30-some years, um, and uh, uh, is that you've convinced uh, um, the folks uh, who share Senator Brownback's view that you're going to be just right for them, and you convince the folks that share Senator Kennedy's view that you're going to be just right for them. Um, and, uh, and so, uh, and I think I'd like to plumb a little bit more closely um, uh, this notion of how you view um, uh, this, this right of privacy. Now, if you take a look at um, um, Justice's, Justice uh, Scalia's um, comment about that right to privacy found in the 14th Amendment is related to the Casey case, he said, the issue is whether abortion is liberty protected by the Constitution of the United States. I am sure it is not because of two simple facts. The Constitution says absolutely nothing about it and the longstanding traditions, etc. Then, on that same case, the uh, quote uh, um, uh, coming from, uh, i got to make sure I get the right justice here, um, from O'Connor, Kennedy and Souter dissent, they said, the liberty of a woman is at stake in a sense unique to the human condition and so unique to the law. The mother who carries a child a full term is subject to anxieties and physical constraints, the pain that only she must bear. Her suffering is too intimate and personal for the state to insist without more upon its own versions of women's role. Two fundamentally different views of the right to privacy as it relates to that issue. In Cruzan, um, the case relating to whether or not uh, fully competent adults have the right to refuse uh, unwanted medical treatment. Uh, Justice Scalia said in his opinion that Quote, that the federal court have no business in this field, that American law has always accorded the state the power to prevent, by force if necessary, suicide, including suicide by refusing appropriate measures necessary to preserve one's life. Justice Kennedy, in the same, in the same case, as you well, I know you know all this, but it's, uh, I just want to try to get a sense where you are. He said, liberty presumes an autonomy of self that includes freedom of thought, freedom of expression, uh, be, excuse me, belief. Fr I mean, let me rephrase that, restate it. Liberty presumes an autonomy of self that includes freedom of thought, belief, e expression, and certain intimate conduct. The instant case involves liberty of the person both in its spatial and in its transcendental dimensions. Obviously, fundamentally different. And then the same goes uh, um, uh, when, when he talks about uh, when O'Connor says, I agree that the protected liberty interest in refusing unwanted medical treatment may be inferred from our prior decisions and that refusal of artificially delivered food or water is encompassed within the liberty interest. Justice Brennan. So the point I'm making is obvious that there are very, very, very disparate views. Can you tell me? What's, what's, what side you come down closer on? Well, uh, Senator, first I'm of all... I'm asking you to comment on any case. Well, um, I, I can say that uh, it is my view that all of the justices, I think of the case like the Glucksburg case, in which uh, the majority subscribe to the view that there is an appropriate mode of analysis to determine the content of the Liberty Clause, that it does include protection beyond physical restraint and that that protection applies in a substantive manner. Um, now, there are legal theorists, there are judges, jurists, who do not agree with that, who do not agree 
that there is a right of privacy protected uh, under the Due Process Clause, who do not agree that the liberty protected extends beyond freedom from physical restraint. Their view is that it means you cannot be basically imprisoned or arrested without due process, and that means only that you get some type of procedural protection. Um, that is not my understanding of where the justices on the Supreme Court are, uh, and it's not my understanding. Uh, I believe that the liberty protected by the Due Process Clause is not limited to freedom from physical restraint, that it includes certain other protections, including the right to privacy. As you know, that the, that the court has tried to map out in a series of cases that go back to Meyer versus Nebraska and Pierce and all that, and in, in, in various instances as the claims have arisen, uh, and that it's protected not simply from procedural deprivation. That is... If I may interrupt. I, I, that's not the question I ask you. I thank you for that lesson. Um, and, uh, um, uh, and, I, and I understand what you're saying. I'm asking you a specific question. Well, and do you side more with within that context with the views of Scalia and Thomas would say that consenting adults do not have, whether if they're both male or female, do not have the right to engage in sexual conduct. The state can determine that. I mean, let me, let me, put, let me put it another way. My family faced, I'm sure many people in this audience's families faced the difficult decision of deciding uh, when to no longer continue the application of artificial apparatus to keep your father or mother or husband or wife or son or daughter alive. Um, it's of great moment to the American public now. Um, and uh, there is a view expressed by Justice Scalia that there is no right that is absolute on the part, or no fundamental right, that exists um, for a family member, assuming the person is not capable of making the decision themselves, to make that judgment. He says, and I'm speaking in layman's terms, he says the state legislature can make that decision. I firmly believe, unless there's some evidence that the family is incompetent, the husband or the wife, with the advice of the doctor, should be able to make that decision. What do you think? Well, Senator, that does get into an area that is coming before the court. There's a case pending on the docket right now that raises the question of whether or not state legislatures have a prerogative to lay down rules on certain end-of-life issues. Well, well that's suicide, that, isn't it, Judge? Well, in that case, it's the, the application of the federal controlled substantive law. Right. The issue of uh, illness in those cases do come before the court. The Glucksburg case raised uh, a similar question. The Cruzan case that you mentioned presented it in the very difficult context of an incompetent I individual no longer uh, able to make a decision and the question of how the state law should apply in that situation. Those cases do come before the court. Do you think the state, had, well, j just talk to me as a father. Don't talk to me. Just tell me, just philosophically, what do you think? Do you think that is, that is an, not what the Constitution says? What do you feel? Do you feel personally, if you're w willing to share with us, that, that the decision of whether or not to remove a feeding tube after a family member is no longer capable of making a judgment, They're, they are comatose, uh, um, uh, to prolong that life should be one that, uh, that the legislators in Dover, Delaware should make or my mother no, should I'm make. not going to consider issues like that in the context as a father or a husband or, or anything else. Um, uh, well, you did, I think. Sorry. I think, obviously, uh, uh, putting aside any of those considerations, these issues uh, are the most difficult we face um, uh, as, as people, um, uh, and they are profoundly affected by uh, views of uh, individuality and moral views uh, and uh, deeply personal views. Now, uh, that's obviously true as a general matter, but at the same time, the position of a judge uh, is not to incorporate his or her personal views in deciding issues of this sort. Um, if you're interpreting a particular statute that governs in this area, your job as a judge is to interpret and apply that according to the rule of law. If you're addressing uh, 
claims of a fundamental right under the uh, liberty protected by the due process clause. Again, the view of a judge on a personal matter or a personal level is not the guide to the decision. All right. Well, and Judge, let me ask you then, with your permission, about uh, well, your constitutional view. Do you think the Constitution encompasses a fundamental right for my father to conclude that he does not want to continue, he does not want to continue on a life support system? Well, Senator, I can't answer that question in the abstract because... It's not abstract. That's real. Well, Senator, as a legal matter, it is abstract because the question would be in any particular case, uh, is there a law that applies that governs that decision? What does the law apply? That's, that's the question, Judge. Well, can no. any law, can any law trump a fundamental right to die? Not to commit suicide, a right to decide. I no longer want to be hooked up to this machine. The only thing is keeping me alive. I no longer want to have this feeding tube in my stomach. A decision that I know I've personally made and many people out here have made. And the idea that a state legislature could say to my mom, your father wants the feeding tube removed. He's asked me, the doctors heard it, and the state legislature's decided that no, it can't be removed. Are you telling me that's even in play? Well, Senator, what I'm telling you is, as you know, there are cases that come up in exactly that context so that it is in play and the sense are, is that there are cases involving disputes between people asserting their rights to terminate life to remove feeding tubes uh, either on their own behalf or on behalf of others there are, is legislation that states have passed in this area that governs that and there are claims that are raised that the legislation is unconstitutional those are issues that come before the court um, and as a result, um, I will confront those issues in light of the court's precedence with an open mind. I will not take to the court whatever personal views I have on the issues, and I appreciate the sensitivity involved. They won't be based on my personal views. They'll be based on my understanding of the law. That's what I want to know about, because without any knowledge of your understanding of the law, because you will not share it with us, we are rolling the dice with you, Judge. We are going to face decisions, you are, and the American public is going to face decisions about whether or not, as I said, patents uh, or patents can be issued for uh, uh, the creation of human life. We're going to be, you're going to be faced with decisions about whether or not um, there is a right to refuse uh, extraordinary medical, um, uh, um, uh, heroic medical efforts that you don't want as an individual, and you're fully capable mentally of making that decision. And the idea that without a specific pack, fact pattern before you, as someone keeps, it keeps getting repeated here, the law is about life. It's about facts, specific facts. When I'm asking you, there's no fact situation before you about whether or not a person fully mentally capable of making the decision, chooses to say, I no longer want this feeding tube in my stomach, please remove it, and whether or not that is a fundamental constitutional right. Senator, that's asking me for an opinion in the abstract on a question that will come before the court. And when that question does come before the court, the litigants before me are entitled to have a justice deciding their case with an open mind based on the arguments presented, based on the precedents presented. I've told you uh, with respect how I would go about deciding that case. It begins with the recognition that the liberty protected by the Due Process Clause does extend to matters of privacy, that it's not limited to restraints on physical freedom, uh, and that that protection is protected in a sub extends in a substantive way and not simply procedurally. I have also explained the sources that judges look to in determining the content of that privacy protected by the Liberty Clause. They're the ones that have been spelled out in the court's opinions the nation's history, traditions, and practices. And I've explained how judges apply that history, tradition, and practices in light of the limited role of a judge uh, to interpret the law and not make the law. The limited well, role of the judge in light of the prerogatives I, of the legislature. Judge, I understand that uh, Justice Scalia says the same thing and draws a very fundamentally different conclusion.
and O'Connor. Right. Fundamentally. And, and so you've told me nothing, Judge. With all due respect, you've not, look, this is, it's kind of interesting, this kabuki dance we have in these hearings here. As if the public doesn't have a right to know what you think about fundamental issues facing them. There's no more possibility that any one of us here would be elected to the United States Senate without expressing broadly and sometimes specifically to our public what it is we believe. The idea that the founders sat there and said, oh, look, here's what we're going to do. We're going to require the two elected branches to answer questions of the public with no presumption they should have the job as senator, president, or congressman. But guess what? We're going to have a third co-equal branch of government that gets to be there for life, never, ever, ever again to be able to be asked a question they don't want to answer. And you know what? He doesn't have to tell us anything. It's okay as long as he is, as you are, a decent, bright, honorable man. That's all we need to know. That's all we need to know. Look, let's, I only have three minutes and 45 seconds left. And by the way, I'd ask uh, permission for the record to introduce the number of questions asked by Senator Hatch and others, very specific questions asked to uh, Justice O'Connor with very specific answers on these very questions. Uh, I'd like to ask that to be submitted for the record. Without objection, they will be made a part of the record. Let me Senator, conclude I, by, uh, if, if I, I still have the floor and I'll, be yield, I'll yield to you since you can speak after the clock's out, I can't, okay? I'm sure you understand that. Um, and I'm sure if I'm ever before the Supreme Court, you'll give me more time and you won't interrupt me. Um, the, uh, uh, all kidding, uh, <laughs> the, look, um, here's, here, here, here's the point I want to make. I asked, and I'm, I'm sure you're not going to answer it. I asked Justice Ginsburg the question about footnote five in the Michael H. case. And the whole issue there is, as you well know, whether or not you keep talking, it sounds wonderful to the uneducated ear, the non-lawyer's ear, that I'm going to look at history and tradition. You and I both know how you determine history and tradition determines outcomes. In that case, as you'll recall, there was a question of whether or not a, a, the natural father, you could prove by a blood test and DNA that he was the natural father of a child he wanted to see that happened to be born to a woman who was living with her married husband. So the child was illegitimate, right? And so in determining whether or not there are any visitation rights, there's a famous footnote there. And I'm going to do this quickly at two minutes and seven seconds. The court said, Scalia said in footnote six, look, you go back and look at the specific historical precedent. Short circuiting it. Have bastards ever been protected in the law? And Brandon said, no, 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 that's not what you go back. You go back and look at fatherhood. Was fatherhood ever something that's part of the traditions and part of the embraced notions of what we hold dear? Is that worthy of protection? Now, Scalia said, no, 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 no. I looked up the record. Bastards have never been protected in English common law. Therefore, there's nothing going on here. And by the way, you should never go back, he says, and look at the general proposition. Has fatherhood achieved a status of consequence? No, it's have bastards achieved. So, Judge, how do you, I'm not asking you in that case, how do you, do you look at the narrowest reading of whether or not such an asserted right has ever been protected, or do you look at it more broadly? What yeah. is the methodology you use? Yeah, I, I, I mean, I think you're quite right that that is quite often the critical question in these cases, the degree of generality at which you define what the tradition, the history, and the practice you're, you're looking at. The example I think that uh, I've always found it easiest to grasp was, the, was Loving Against Virginia. Do you look at the history of miscegenation statutes or do you look at the history of marriage and 33 and, seconds left do you agree with o'connor then well i get extra time you said i know the, but i but uh, i don't i got to get it in now <laughs> before the chairman judge, judge roberts when his red light goes on you'll have as much time as you want thank you uh the uh point is that again the court has precedence on precisely that question about how you should phrase the level of generality, and you look but at which case, precedent do you agree with? There's, there's competing, there are competing precedents. Well, you do not look at the level of generality that is the issue that's 
being challenged. So, for example, in Loving versus Virginia, if the challenge is, it seems to me, and this is what the court's precedents say, if the challenge is to miscegenation uh, statutes, that's not the level of generality because you're going to answer it's completely circular. No, that's, but that's specific, Judge. The, the generality was the right to marry. Well, that's that's the I'm, generality. That's what I'm saying. The dispute is do you look at it at that level of specificity or broader? And I'm saying you do not look at it at a, the narrowest level of generality, which is the statute that's being challenged, because obviously that's completely circular. You're seeing there is obviously that statute uh, that's part of the history. So you You're look good. at it at a broader level of generality. Now, the only point I was going to make earlier, because I do think it's an important one, you make the point that we stand for election and we wouldn't be elected if we didn't tell people what we stand for. Judges don't stand for election. I'm not standing for election. And it is contrary to the role of judges in our society to say that this judge should go on the bench because these are his or her positions and those are the positions they're going to apply. Judges go on the bench and they apply and decide cases according to the judicial process, not on the basis of promises made earlier to get elected or promises made earlier to get confirmed. That's inconsistent with the independence and integrity of the Supreme Court. No one's asking for a promise. Thank you very much, Thank Senator you. Biden. Thank you, Judge. Thank you, Senator. Senator Kyle. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think this last exchange uh, is important because um, it goes back to what we talked about at the very beginning when some of us in our opening statements pledged to defend you if you uh, stopped short of answering every question the way that every senator uh, felt uh, important based upon your view that the matter in question might come before the court, that the canons of judicial ethics preclude you from doing that. A very wise senator uh, on this committee once said something. Let me uh, quote it to you. And by the way, I, I contend that he is still wise. But I'm the wise one. <clears throat> I, I'm sorry? Um, it's, um, and, and this is what he said. Uh, Judge, you not only have a right to choose what you will answer and not answer, but in my view, you should not answer a question of what your view will be on an issue that clearly is going to come before the court in 50 different forms, probably over your tenure on the court. Now, as I said, that, that was wise then, it's wise now. It is the statement of then Chairman Joseph Biden in the Ginsburg hearings. And in all sincerity, uh, I do believe Senator Biden to be wise, and I believe that that comment is wise. It's what's animated your uh, approach to answering probably by now hundreds of questions that have been asked of you. And you've answered every question. In some cases, however, you have stopped short of advising us um, what you believe the law to be because you felt that that matter was going to come before the court. But you didn't stop there. When permitted, you, you expanded to tell us why, why you thought uh, it was a matter that might come before the court and what your general approach to the case would be in terms of your judicial philosophy, how you would approach judging the case, but that you didn't want to talk about your view of what the law was, both because the case uh, uh, could come before the court and also because it's pretty hard to formulate in a question all of the factual considerations that would permit you to know what law would be specifically applicable to that particular case. And you and I talked a little bit about the facial challenge to statutes versus the as applied kind of problem. Um, so with respect to this last uh, interchange you had with, uh, with Senator Biden, uh, and, and by the way, I'll, I'll say uh, again to compliment my colleagues, if, if anybody ever contended that senators weren't um, uh, both diligent in pursuing uh, what they want to pursue and also very imaginative, um, they should watch this hearing because uh, we've been blessed with, uh, with most creative ways of trying to pull out of you commitments on matters that senators would like to have you make commitments on. But as Senator Biden just said, um, uh, and I'm paraphrasing here, he said, without the knowledge of your personal views, he was talking at the time about end-of-life issues, we're rolling the dice. And your response to that, as I understand it, is my personal views are irrelevant to a case that comes before me of Jones versus Smith, of X versus Y. What I personally think about issues has nothing to do with the resolution of the dispute between those two parties. 
And were I to let them intrude, I would not be doing my job as a judge, fairly taking the facts of their case and then applying the law that I understand it to be to reach a decision. Moreover, uh, Judge, isn't it the case that if you were to uh, state your, your views on such uh, subjects as they might pertain to a case that would come before the court, wouldn't you actually have to recuse yourself from, from deciding that, that case and therefore all of the discussion, all of the effort to get you committed to a particular point of view would be for naught because if you expressed it, you couldn't sit on the case anyway or am I incorrect in that? I, I think that's a concern that other nominees have raised uh, in, in the past, particularly given the expression of the views as part of the confirmation process. Um, it's, it's not uh, supposed to be a bargaining process and if you start stating views with respect to particular issues of concern to one senator, then obviously everyone's going to have their list. Um, and when that individual nominee, if confirmed, if the bargain is successful from his or her point of view and he gets confirmed, uh, he'll have to begin each case not with the party's briefs and arguments, but with the transcript of the confirmation hearing to see what he or she swore to under oath was their view in a particular area of law or a particular case. And I think that would be, uh, would undermine the independence of the Supreme Court. It would undermine the integrity of the judicial process. Uh, every one of the justices on the court today, uh, every one of them refused to engage in that type of uh, process and if I'm to sit with them, if I am confirmed, I feel I have to follow the same approach. Now, I do think I've been more expansive uh, than most nominees. Uh, I've gone back and read the transcripts and some of them would not talk about particular cases even if it were unlikely that the case was going to come before the court. And the reason they gave was, <coughs> look, it's hard to draw the line. If I think this case is not going to come before the court, what about this one? And maybe that will. And rather than trying to draw the line, I'm just not going to do it. Uh, and those justices were confirmed. Um, I've taken what I think is a more pragmatic approach. If I think an issue is not likely to come before the court, I have told the committee what my views on that case uh, were, or what my views on that case are. Um, uh, you know, perhaps that means I'm in, uh, draw, it's sometimes difficult to draw the line, perhaps that's right. Uh, but again, if, if I make the judgment, and other nominees may draw the line differently, uh, uh, may have drawn it differently in the past or differently in the future. The, the, the nominee, I think, has to be comfortable with the proposition that they're not doing anything that's going to undermine the integrity of the, uh, uh, the court. Well, and I noted yesterday in response to a question, uh, uh, you said, well, that's, that's the reward for trying to be more expansive. I, you were talking uh, about Griswold versus Connecticut at the time, and I thought at the time, uh, boy, he's, uh, he's expressing a view on a relatively recent case, uh, and at least issues associated with it are clearly going to come before the court, and I, I, I wondered, uh, does, that, does, it, does that go too far? Does that cross the line? But y your point was the specific issue in the case and the precise holding of the case are not likely in, you, in your view to come before the court and therefore you expressed uh, your opinion about that case uh, and the law underlining the ruling in the case. Uh, so I would agree with you that not only have you, um, have you attempted to answer every one of our questions, but uh, you, you have also um, ventured into expressing your personal views on matters that you didn't think would come before the court, although as you note, it's at least possible that some of them might, so hopefully you haven't gone too far there. Um, this, I, I think, is a great civics lesson. Um, some of this hearing should be encapsulated in, in law school courses uh, to remind us about the difference between elected officials who make policy and judges who are not supposed to make policy. I thought the questioning, I believe it was by Senator Brownback earlier, was instructive. You noted that the primary check and balance on the judiciary was its own self-restraint. Many of us believe that the court has not exercised appropriate self-restraint in all cases. And that when it doesn't, it naturally generates uh, concern expressed by the citizens of the country as reflected certainly by their elected representatives. And, uh, and we do express that concern. I think the court has failed to exercise appropriate restraint in several matters. And um, one of the things that appeals to me from your approach to the law is that it appears to be a very traditional approach uh, 
which is that I'm not sent there to make law. I'm sent there to take whatever case comes before us and just decide the case. And uh, that element of self-restraint and modesty is one which I think uh, should be more uh, the rule uh, than, than it is today in courts at all levels. And I would commend that philosophy to, uh, to all of the judges. Uh, I think you've expressed it very well. And uh, while I appreciate my colleagues' desire to try to draw you out on your personal views about matters, I, I think you have drawn the line at an appropriate place. And you've certainly provided us with a great deal of, uh, of information in the process. And again, partly because you've explained to us uh, when you could not completely satisfy uh, a senator's curiosity why that was the case, but still tried to inform us about uh, the, uh, the basic issues that might exist in the case, the basic arguments that would be made on either side, uh, but without giving us a hint as to which one of those you thought you might, uh, uh, might come down on the, on the side of. And I also think it's important that you have totally eschewed ideology here, saying that your own personal views or ideology don't have a place um, in, in your decision making, and therefore they don't have, uh, are, are pretty irrelevant to the questions that are asked here. Um, I've got a whole notebook of questions uh, here that to one extent or another have been dealt with, I think, by colleagues. And I, I don't think it serves purpose to go over them again. Let, let me just conclude with kind of a general comment. But before I do, um, just uh, try to correct the record on, on, or not necessarily correct, but add to the record on one very narrow point. Uh, you were discussing, I believe, with Senator Kennedy, the uh, Herrera versus Collins case. and. He talked about uh, innocence claims uh, being um, uh, heard uh, by, the, by the court, that, a, that a, a prisoner should have the right to present innocence claims. I just wanted to ask you, is it not the case that in that uh, Herrera versus Collins case that it did not address the proper route for bringing claims based on newly discovered forensic evidence such as DNA testing, which is, of course, a relatively new phenomenon now, but that was not the issue presented in that case? Uh, that's right. There wasn't, um, I don't know if they had as much access to that type of evidence back then when it was argued, but it was certainly not that type of evidence. It was a new claim uh, that somebody else did it, uh, somebody who had just died. Uh, that was the new claim of, of, uh, that they sought to raise at the, at the last uh, stage there. Um, and I do think any issue arising with respect to DNA evidence, and those issues are working their ways way up through the court, uh, those cases would have to be addressed on their own terms. Yeah, thank you. Well, let me conclude with this point. <clears throat> Some uh, who are watching might, might come to the conclusion that there's a lot of repetition here <clears throat> and uh, that to some extent uh, there's a lot of senator talk expressing concern to you about different issues that, that, uh, that are important to them. Um, frankly, I think this is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity uh, it is the only time that, before you uh, take your position on the court, you'll have the opportunity to be directly lobbied in the political context uh, in an appropriate way. We reflect the views of our constituents. And we've all got different issues on our minds. And, and there isn't a one of them that is not a legitimate issue or concern. Uh, I, I brought up the, the, the matter of applying foreign law to American decisions uh, on our Constitution, uh, for example. It seems to me appropriate that you hear from us, the political branch, concerns that we have about the way that the court approaches its job. Uh, we may be right, we may be wrong, but it's important for you to hear that. I know that justices read the newspapers and so on. But this is a very good forum to have ex expressed to you concerns that we have about various issues. And we wouldn't be talking about them if we didn't think that they would come before the court. So in a sense, virtually everything we're talking about, we're, we're trying in some way to get a point across to you because we believe it is likely to be decided by you. And I think that's fine. You need to hear from us what our concerns are, even though perhaps we're trying to draw you out in areas that you obviously can't be drawn out in. Uh, uh, with respect to future cases. Uh, it's also important for us to get the feedback from you. There won't be very many other times that we will have as a group of senators to sit down with the person that will likely be the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court and have a legal conversation with you. Uh, 
Um, we'll have to talk about matters relating to court administration. That'll be totally appropriate, and I'm sure we'll be doing that. But by and large, this is the only chance we have to have this kind of an interchange with you. It is illuminating to me as a student of constitutional law, as someone who's practiced before the court. I've learned a lot. And therefore, to those who on the outside say, well, it looks like a lot of senators posturing, uh, if they're listening very closely to your answers, I think they will, they will find a great deal of, of meat, of knowledge, of the application of your wisdom to how you approach judging. And I find it very consistent with the traditions of our court and the rule of law in our country. And this, therefore, becomes a very good reminder of what our rule of law is all about, what judging is based on, and the interrelationship between the representative bodies of our government and the third branch, which you represent. I think this is all very instructive, very informative, and in my case, at least, with regard to your testimony, uh, very comforting. Because it seems to me that you are following the great tradition of the court in your approach to the law, uh, that you are careful, that you are cautious, and yet you are willing to, to look at the circumstances of our contemporary times in applying your judgment to the law that is before you. And because I, I have that confidence, it's my intention to support your nomination. And um, uh, because I, I think it unnecessary to delve into any other specific questions, uh, I will yield back the remaining five minutes of my time. Mr. Mr. Chairman. Senator, <clears throat> Senator Biden. A point of personal privilege, as we say in this body. Since on, on, on my time, since I had five minutes and I referred to Senator Biden, please. Thank you. Take my time I just, uh, I've been quoted many times about what I said to Justice Ginsburg. With the permission of the chairman, let's just take a second. I'd like to read my whole quote, if I may, and then Senator submit Biden, it all for may, the record. You may do that. Uh, you okay. even have more time. Senator Kyle's given No, you no, I, I don't want to use the time. I, let me just say, here's what else I said. I said, now, I hope, as I said to you very briefly, that the way in which you outline the circumstances under which you would reply and not reply, that you will not make a blanket refusal to comment on things, because obviously everything we could ask you is bound to come before the court. There is not a controversial issue in this country that does not have the prospect of coming before the court. If continuing, if a nominee, although it is their right, does not answer questions that don't go to the way they would decide, but how they would decide, I will vote against that nominee regardless of who it is. It's a continuing quote. And you can thank Justice Scalia for that. At the close of the testimony, I said, I would also point out that my concerns about you not answering questions have been met. You've answered my questions the second day and the third day. At least from my perspective, you've been forthcoming as any recent witness has. I submit the entire statement for the record along with the answers to her questions from Senator Hatch, you, and others. Without objection, thank they will be made a part of the record. I thank the Chairman for his courtesy, and I thank the, uh, the witness for listening. It is now 1230, and a vote, two votes have been scheduled at this time. So we will uh, take a lunch recess until... Until 1.45, quarter of two. Thank you, Mr. Chairman.
lunch break on this third day of hearings for John Roberts, the nominee for Chief Justice. They should be back at about uh, 2 o'clock Eastern. We'll update the schedule just as soon as we know. We're going to take you outside the hearing.